appreciate everyone being on call this morning, Mike, especially you. Uh, we're going to run through some advanced concepts in sagittal plane deformity. And um, thank you for being here, Mike. Take it away. Yeah, I can see. Here's the title of the talk, is sagittal plane in a half an hour. I love it. All right. Some of this is a rehash for you guys, but I, the more you hear it, the more it tends to make sense. There are my disclosures. Uh, we'll talk about sagittal plane development, sagittal plane balance in the cone of economy. Understand all of the proposed alignment schemes that are like um, very public and, um, and uh, popular. And then just to think about how you can conceptualize this and I'll bring it all together to create individualized uh, alignment targets. It'll be very interesting also hear Dr. A's take on it at the end because I think half the time when we do things uh, people that have been doing surgery for a while say, yeah, you know, we, we, we talked about this a while ago. I know for sure that uh, Art Steffi used to talk about just getting the hips underneath the sacrum and then you'd be good. And uh, we seem to have forgotten that. Sagittal plane development, right? Apes have a globally kyphotic spine. We differ from the apes because we stand upright and, and walk erect without dragging our knuckles on the ground, uh, especially the neurosurgeons. Some of the orthopedic surgeons are still knuckle draggers. We develop in kyphosis in utero, right? Everything is kyphotic, sacrum, lumbar spine, thoracic spine, and cervical spine. And the acquired sagittal curvatures come with bipedalism. Sometimes the, the trainees don't always know the, the pimp questions that there's primary and acquired sagittal plane curvatures, right? The primary sagittal plane curvatures are thoracic kyphosis and sacral kyphosis. The acquired are cervical. Cervical alignment, you shouldn't even say cervical lordosis, cervical alignment and lumbar lordosis. So as we become mobile, right, those cervical and lumbar kyphotic alignments begin to change. First, you do tummy time and you want to maintain horizontal gaze. So you get cervical hyperextension. Then you start to crawl and you get some lumbar lordosis, perhaps even a bit of thoracic lordosis. Then you stand upright and really develop the ability to, to um, stand without expending energy with a balance of sacral alignment, which is actually pelvic incidence, lumbar alignment, which is usually lordosis almost always, though a great spectrum of where the lordosis is and how much you have. Thoracic kyphosis, cervical alignment, to get you to stand in what Dubuset called the cone of economy, right? And that is this position where you can stand without expending energy. And it's the departure from the cone of economy that makes some people seek surgical treatment, um, but not always. And it is certainly the departure from the cone of economy in a fixed situation when you have an iatrogenic fused flat back. Interesting things to think about for this. One is uh, like this is now, now in my practice, right, that I'm currently not treating <coughs> actual adults uh, is that in the AIS, right, there's real no, no, there, no one has an individualized target alignment scheme. Um, Kariman, uh, Genevois, and Rousseli have a sort of classification and say normalize this and normalize that. And then most US-based people say like, oh, well, this is the thoracic lordosis and you need to make it as kyphotic as possible and you just pull as hard as you can. And I would, I would be willing to bet somebody a buck that sort of trying as hard as you can and putting everybody in some general same place is just as bad as sort of fixing them in 15 degrees of a relative flat back because that's as much lordosis as you could get that day. It's probably not correct. Uh, and so one of my goals now is to try and figure out how to individualize target alignments for uh, AIS. And also the other thing is uh, target alignments for neuromuscular scoliosis, right? Standing upright, your pelvic version changes and lumbar alignment changes because you're, you're working, you're, you want to avoid doing work to stand upright. Sitting down is totally different, right? You, you have some pelvic retroversion, the lumbar spine becomes flat. And I would, I think that that probably is why lots of the neuromuscular spines that we do where people just like, you know, put them in traction, halo femoral traction, pull on it, straighten the whole thing out and that they tend to do okay. Some of them don't. And some of them it's probably related to too flat of a back or too forward of a position or even in too, too much lordosis. But one of the things we know for sure and neuromuscular scoliosis is the preservation of their lumbar hyperlordosis lowers HRQOL. And for anyone who's like take, taking a look through um, orthopediatric set, they had uh, custom rods made or like you know targeted rods made. 
that are fixed. Their, their rods are like candy canes. And I said, what the hell are these things? And they're like, oh, these are for the really lordotic spines. And I was like, you realize that that's the number one thing we got to fix in those and not preserve that. And it was like, they, they had no idea what I was talking about. So leaving the cone of economy, right? I just said it's a frequent indication for surgery, but in forward alignment, right? It can be debilitating. It is not ubiquitous that it is debilitating. What is ubiquitous is that life is a kyphosing process. And you can see here, the images on the side here, right, is a not fused asymptomatic individual from our asymptomatic EOS cohort, right? ODI is less than 20, no complaints, no prior surgeries, as opposed to the person on the right who's miserable because they're fixed and we have created this problem. So you cannot conflate um, the two different sagittal plane alignments and say that this is the target when this is a similar result and this is debilitating. So the first alignment classification, comprehensive alignment classification that discussed all of these relative lumbopelvic parameters uh, was really SRS Schwab, where the beauty of it is that Schwab both recognized the importance of the pelvic incidence and the relationship between pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis in terms of creating disability uh, or lack thereof. This did provide early rudimentary alignment targets, and it also provided us with the nice um, categories and simple equations that we like, right? We want categories. I want to know mild, moderate, severe. Uh, our, that's how our brains work. The problem is that you really tend to muddy the waters when you use categories. Problems caused by categorization of continuous variables. And the example here is 10.5. Is it non-pathologic or is it moderate? right? SVA 4.5 is non-pathologic or moderate. And that is something that you could go between day to day, right? Measure and even inter, inter um, rater reliability and intra rater reliability, probably pretty close to putting you on the thresholds of these sort of um, pleasing categories, but at the end of the day, somewhat nonsensical categories. And then the other thing also is that these offer PILL relationships and, and understand that pelvic tilt, all pelvic tilt is, is a measure of malalignment. And targeting pelvic tilts is probably not what we should be doing. Targeting lordosis and lordosis distribution is what we should be doing. And then the result will be elimination of pelvic tilt and elimination of compensatory pelvic tilt. So a patient with a PI of 80 may very well probably have a pelvic tilt greater than 20 degrees and be totally normal. A patient with a PI of 40, if they have a pelvic tilt of 10, that can actually be very bad and be uh, quite a bit of pelvic retroversion and compensation for their lumbar flatback. So these, that's where these things sort of fall, but at least it started us on the course of PI and LL relationships. And so if, is the goal normal, right? And that goes back to this idea of categories according to population means. The median isn't the message. Stephen Gould was a statistician who was diagnosed with cancer. And he said, well, what's my prognosis? And they said, ah, you know, median survival is 1.7 years. And he said, I don't care what median survival is. I need to know what my survival is. And that's where we need to take, I think the vast majority of what we do, be it lumbar alignment, cervical spondylotic myelopathy care, when to intervene, right? For my, it's all the same. All of this is a, a dist, like a, a continuum of the same concept of as we move towards personalized medicine and giving people individualized targets. Um, if Greg will have me back, we can do a whole talk about machine learning for informed decision-making and all that, which is really the future for uh, getting good outcomes, uh, health-related quality of life outcomes, right? So the median is in the message. Pelvic incidence, Frank linked it directly to the sagittal plane alignment, and it led to the very commonly cited PI plus or minus 10, which is not what he wrote, right? He wrote PI minus LL is less than 10. He didn't give you a 20 degree range, give you a 10 degree range. It's turned into a 20 degree range. Why did it turn into a 20 degree range? Probably because that makes life easier, um, makes the surgeries easier, makes the blood loss less, makes your outcomes worse, I think. So next, uh, Pierre Rousseli uh, from Lyon, he understood uh, the, the relationship be between pelvic incidence and what he, he goes off of sacral slope. 
The problem is that you can only classify someone according to sacral slope before they have degenerated and developed either degenerative deformity or iatrogenic deformity. So for me, it's not that useful. And, and it's a little bit of a, a debate every time I speak with him and Kariman about it. Um, Cause you don't know how to classify someone once they're fused and, and degenerated. He used a cohort of 160 asymptomatic volunteers uh, to originally describe four distinct standing sagittal profiles. And it's been developed now into five standing sagittal profiles. And the real, the takeaway from this is that it's based upon the shape of the lordosis and the distribution of the lordosis, all based upon their pelvic instance. And now Frank Schwab, if you present this, Frank will criticize this for having categories and say, well, it's, this is nonsense. These are just categories. It's a continuum. I think if you can like put into your head that this is actually a continuum and this continuum goes from low PI on the left, to high PI on the right. And as you go from left to right, the apex of lumbar lordosis moves north, right? So a type one has a very, the apex is the L5 vertebral body. The arc of lower lordosis is essentially L3 to the sacrum. And it's interesting to think about that, right? Because we all talk about LL is L1 to S1. Why did we choose L1? It's kind of random. It's got nothing to do with anything other than it doesn't have a rib on it and it's the lumbar spine. Um, but if you look here, right, the arc of lordosis is way below L1. It's L3 to the sacrum. And it's a C with a little wiggle. And these are generally PI of under 50 patients, under 45 to under 50. And now as we move this way, right, this is the 45 to 55. This is a very subtle S shape, right? It's now the arc, the apex is L4. You have some lordosis below L4, some above, but it's a subtle S shape with a little thoracic hyphosis. And also, right, the C7 SBA will tend to fall towards the back of the sacrum. Type ones can actually see this. They can be negative, which we generally think of as the kiss of death. It's a kiss of death for a type four. It is generally not for a type one. This is the other one that he later described as the type three antiverted. And you'll start seeing these in, in clinic if you look for them, where the people have essentially zero PT and a pretty profound S shape to their spine in the setting of low pelvic incidence. Now, as pelvic incidence goes to 60 and higher, right? These are like the 60s to 75s. These are the over 75s, right? Pelvic tilt is increasing. Look at where the hips are going in relation to the pelvis, right? The hips are going out front because as your pelvic incidence goes up, you can tolerate more pelvic tilt. So it's not pathologic, it's normal. Apex of lordosis moves up here. They're at L3. This is really the three, four disc. And you have a S-shaped thoracic spine, right? You have thoracic kyphosis that exists in relation to this lumbar lordosis to maintain ultimately horizontal gaze. So what's the goal of our surgeries, right? If you're thinking about sagittal plane, we want to improve their symptoms, right? Which obviously like, I, I'm still reviewing articles that say sagittal plane doesn't matter, decompress the nerve roots, they do well. That's not the case, that's totally wrong. Uh, I think we need to stop thinking like that because we want durable results. If you have engaged compensatory mechanisms after surgery, you might do well for a short while, but eventually they're gonna kick in. You're either gonna degenerate and get adjacent segment disease, or your back's going to tuck around and you're going to get that low back pain, back pain. After that, after that, we want to minimize the fusion levels. And so we all know about this, right? You guys, most of the people on this call probably heard me sort of rant and rave about this, but as I rant and rave, it becomes more refined and a little more erudite, I think, um, to make it clear how wrong this is. So age-adjusted alignment targets, they were initially proposed as targets for health-related quality of life. Uh, and Greg and I spoke briefly the other day. I'm sorry I didn't make it to, grant, uh, to journal club. If you guys want to do a couple, like one or two journal clubs on alignment targets in these papers, I am happy to do it. The, the age-adjusted paper is just atrocious. Um, so it initially proposed as targets for health-related quality of life. Then, with subs then they claim that this, like, they say, okay, step one, we've achieved it. This is correct. Then we go back and say, okay, are you aligned or not? categorizing according to something that Mike Kelly thinks is wrong and say, oh, there's a suggestion of decreased PJK, PJF. Now, does age-adjusted alignment targets, do they even pass face validity? That's the first thing you got to do when you read this stuff. Like, does it, is it reasonable? No, it's totally unreasonable. 
Spinal degeneration is multifactorial and only partially attributable to age, right? Age is not static. Unless you're in the movie Tenet, you're moving forward through time. So if you're 50 and you're gonna live to 70, where do we fix you? We fix you where you're 50? Or suppose you're on the, I think they did their uh, age in decades by fives. So what if you're 55 and you're gonna be 56 in three months? What do we do? It just doesn't make sense. And furthermore, the idea um, that we have a little bit from WashU and uh, Chris Ames at UCSF is this idea of investigating biological versus chronological age, right? When we've always gone off of chronological age, and, and I think especially the residents of San Diego where people are healthy and exercise, you guys know better than anyone that you'll have some spry 73 year old uh, and then you could come, you know, go do a visitation in St. Louis and see a 50 year old that'll make your head spin. Um, because it's the biology of the patient and not necessarily the, the chronology of the patient. So they propose these targets, right? They propose all of these targets, pelvic tilt of 11 degrees if you're less than 35 and 25 degrees if you're over 75, independent of pelvic incidence, even though if we are going to sort of assimilate the ideas of Rusali, we know that, um, that these things vary with pelvic incidence far more strongly than they do vary with age. And why, what is the problem with this, right? One is that it's this idea of confounding variables, right? Age-adjusted alignment targets fail to accommodate degeneration. They do not account for degeneration. And we know time and time again, and I use Scott Bowden's lumbar spine MRI paper from I think his residency that's in JBJS that shows that as you get MRIs of people, right? This is on the OITE question. Train, like trainee thing every year, as you get MRIs, you tend to get more degeneration with age. So aging is related to generation. And if you look at a bunch of degenerated uh, or aged adults, by and large, you are actually looking at degenerated related spine changes. And what age adjusted alignment parameters are doing, because age and degeneration are essentially collinear, is offering degeneration adjusted alignment targets, which is totally nonsense, right? No one, that, that wouldn't even like you would get, they wouldn't get on the podium. If you got on the podium, Leah Carrion or Ferran or someone would, would just humili humiliate you. And so, right, this is, the, I, and I, I just moved this slide around, we're gonna do gap in a second, right? But this is a severely malaligned patient, age 71, their PI is 57. They have a high pelvic tilt, right? They have a loss. They have a relative, if you're going to say PI equal LL, they're off by 21 degrees. They have global sagittal plane malalignment, but they're asymptomatic. Now, if they're asymptomatic, we're not going to operate on them. But if you're going to operate on them and you're going to create a biomechanical construct that you want to work, provide disability and be durable, this is not what you're aiming for. So on the Kelly soapbox, right? So that under correction leads to persistent compensatory mechanisms, which are pelvic retroversion. It sounds like in, in deformity, that's how we think about it. But you need to even think about adjacent segment hyperextension. The classic for me is an isthmic spondylo with lumbosacral kyphosis that gets put on LinkedIn because it gets some grandiose, either front, back, or all posterior thing. And it's reduced to a grade 0 0.25 with no lordosis. If you guys look at the adjacent segment disc in those x-rays, it's like Pac-Man because it doesn't have any lordosis and that's not going to work. And you can pat yourself on the back all you want for fixing the, the translation. But if you don't fix the uh, regional alignment through um, sagittal plane, it's not going to, it's not going to be good. Why, what do persistent compensatory mechanisms lead to? It's an unfavorable biomechanical environment for fusion right? Because the back is in tension as they're trying to flex proximal junctional kyphosis at the adjacent segment, adjacent segment degeneration, which is, in my mind is essentially just a less impressive proximal junctional kyphosis, right? So it just degenerates and they fall. Uh, and then the hips, I took all the slides out about how, you know, native hips, we say, oh, you get fused to your sacrum and then the next joint is the hip and wow, your hip goes. How many of those are pelvic retroversions where we have essentially created iatrogenic acetabular dysplasia? right, which is the neurosurgeons probably don't know what I'm talking about, but if you think about the acetabulum in space and you retrovert it, you actually uncover the hip and you change the loading joint forces in the hip and they will wear out faster. There's plenty of evidence to show that in the hip world. Never mind 
um, having already hip replacements in place, right? And raising the risks of dislocation or um, uh, bearing surface wear, right? And this is a nice biomechanical study by Wu Jin Cho that shows that this on the, on the right side is properly aligned, right? And it's just a FEA. And you can see that there's not much ventral force across the uh, adjacent segment up here. But as you flatten the spine and the pelvis in response retroverts, right? This fusion mass actually moving to the left, but the body is forward, right? The body the heads over here. So that's going this way. And you actually create impressive juxtafusional uh, uh, moments about the adjacent segment, and which is why that it will sometimes lead to failure. Not all the time. Problem is that it doesn't lead to failure all the time. And we start to think that it's okay. Uh, and so the European Spine Study Group in distinct uh, opposition to age adjusted, right, proposed the Global Alignment Proportion Study, uh, where if you read it carefully, you'll see that you get a point just for being 65, right? So the moment you're older, you are less tolerant of malalignment. They also very carefully just use mechanical failures. And they use some mechanical failures, like again, if we do a journal club, we can go over it, but some mechanical failures that I feel like Charlar put him in because he needed the numbers. Um, you know, iliac screw fracture after a solid fusion is not that important in my mind. Um, pseudos and PJKs, though, those are discrete, clearly defined uh, events. And they showed that as you become more malaligned, the more poorly you're done, you do. Uh, all right, let me try and wrap this up quick so we can ask questions. But, so my goal, right, doing this study was to look at normal alignment. So we had the means, which is a multi-ethnic alignment normative study from uh, five countries. So we sort of spanned the globe. We got a breadth of ages and I eliminated everyone with any, any suspicion for degeneration, right? Any loss of disc height, any end plate sclerosis, any scoliosis because the coronal plane deformity can affects the sagittal plane and any, I don't know how the ODI greater than 20 snuck in, but we got rid of it. And we measured a lot of angles. One of the things we found, right, is this is a PI of 80, this is a PI of 31, is that people try to stand with the same vertebral body tilts, right? So the L1 tilt for this PI of 80 is minus eight. The L1 tilt for this PI of 31 is minus eight. T1 tilt is minus four and minus two. And ultimately, really what those are just measuring is the global sagittal alignment of the skull, right? And it's the, the French professor Le Huick calls, um, calls it the hip, uh, odontoid hip uh, axis, right? Where he wants to basically draw a straight line down from the skull through the legs so that you know that you're standing normally. Another measure for that is the C2 tilt. And one of the reasons you should understand that is that as you malalign people, they essentially, everyone wants to stand with the same C2 tilt, put the head in the same place. And as you sort of pull them away or push them forward from that position with metal, they're gonna fail more frequently. And that's why that sort of negative patient uh, tends to PJK. What about, so in this cohort, sagittal alignment by age, it's totally unrelated. There's no relationship if you eliminate degeneration, which is why age adjusted alignment targets are measuring a degeneration adjusted alignment targets, not age. If we look at um, L, the L1 pelvic angle, so the vertebral body pelvic angles, which are a nice measure in particular for interoperative because you don't have to worry about end plates, you just go to the centroid. The L1 pelvic angle provides a very nice tight relationship between PI and it's the distribution of lordosis, which means the shape and the magnitude of lordosis uh, with a very high R squared. This is twice the R squared that you do if you just do L1, uh, sorry, if you do LL by PI. And the problem is LL by PI doesn't account for the shape and the shape does matter for where you put that vertebral body in space which therefore matters where you put that skull in space. Things to look at here too. So this is each segment, right? L5 to S1, independent of pelvic incidence. On average, 25 degrees. The range is about 15 to 35. L4 to S1, independent of pelvic incidence, right? R squared is 0.02. In general, somewhere between 30 and 40. Uh, and again, you know, this, the, distribution bars here are a little higher than I'd like, but this gives you a con like a conceptual framework within which to work, particularly for, I think, L4, L5 uh, degenerative spondees. I think we, we all need to sort of do away with the five degree 
a wake T lift L4, L5, pat ourselves in the back. That's just going to go on to adjacent segment to generation. It's really once you get above L4 that you start having changes related to uh, pelvic incidence and distribution of lordosis. Here's a case example, right? This is, I don't know if ESLAC's on. He probably doesn't think I can do anything MIS. This was uh, lateral. These were both done in the lateral. This is lateral a lift, and this is an oblique approach. Then perk screws for a 73 year old who had degeneration, stepwise spondies, uh, and we gave her 15, 17 extra degrees of lordosis through those without losing much blood. The, person, the reason I put this in is because historically we would say, oh, you can't get a lot of lordosis, there's too much blood loss, those are big surgeries. I'm gonna give them the surgery they can tolerate. With the technology we have both from implants and techniques from uh, working with people like Blaskowitz, Mundowitz, Mundus, uh, and Eastlack and whomever else is on the call that, that I've never met, um, you can, like, you can give anyone 80 degrees of lordosis. You might take, like, you might have to stage it, but you don't need to lose, uh, five liters of blood anymore. Those days are done. How to consider, oh, you don't have time for this. So in general, the way to target L1PA is 50% of their pelvic incidence minus 20. And, uh, I can show you a range of pictures if you'd like, but if you think about that, that means really low really low PI people, L1 will be behind the sacrum. Higher PI people, L1 will be in front of the sacrum. And a part of that is the position of the pelvis. Target lordosis as you're building this framework and thinking about where you need to get things, 60% of pelvic incidence plus 30. But the L1PA is nice to have during surgery uh, because you can measure the centroids. And we using this, you can sort of make the plan for where it's got to be when you're going to do it. We got to do away with these days, right? This is LinkedIn where we even have the audacity to, oh, he didn't tag, usually he tags the um, CEO of Medtronic for this personalized plan with monoaxial screws and reduced completely in, in zero degrees of lordosis. That's not, that is not precision medicine. It, precision medicine, uh, it, it is not. It's accurate medicine because they did what they intended to do, but it wasn't precise. Um, L1PA is part of the reasons why we have moved away from anterior column uh, reconstructions, the ACRs with the ALL sacrifice for flat backs, right? If you have a flat back, you have to put the lordosis in the right place. Uh, and if you get the lordosis right, but the L1 pelvic angle is wrong, they will continue to pelvic retroversion and they will fail uh, proximally. We need to avoid the false type two, right? This is a false type two, little S shape here but it's pelvic retroversion, right? Little S shape in a high PI patient. And this patient will just continue to degenerate and degenerate and degenerate unless you fix it. All right, thanks. Sorry, oh, I'm on seven, seven o'clock. Thanks dude, so much. Hey, you know, one of the common things that we hear about is because Russell classified things based off of you know, the normalized population without degeneration. Like when you're in when you're in the office setting, you know, are, is there are there anything is there anything that you're doing that would have, that allows you to more easily classify patients into the different Bruce Lee types as you're thinking through it? I yeah, um, I think it, I, I categorize their pelvic incidence. So under sixty, I'm going to aim for a type one or a type two, and over sixty, I'm going to aim for a type three or type four. Over sixty. In theory, there are people that you can do a T10 to the pelvis on. In general, if you talk to Rusali and Kariman, and even this, I got this from Gupta, once they're going to develop some thoracic kyphosis in compensation or in response, not compensation, in response to your restoration of their alignment, you don't know where they're going to stop. And so they all get an upper thoracic stop site. Uh, unfortunately, I thought I put in different pictures. Um, unless I will do L2 to the pelvis if they are horribly malaligned very low and I can do like a 45 degree L4 or L5 degree PSO, L4, L5 PSO and really correct everything at the bottom and stop within the arc of lordosis. I don't, so I think stopping in the upper arc of lordosis is okay. I think stopping in the lower arc of kyphosis for those high PI people can be bad. So, but I think about it in a spectrum. So low PI, generally a type, either make them a type one or a type two. Higher PI, they're going to be some, like type threes and type fours are basically the same once you understand that 
we want an L1PA. And then I, we, we didn't talk about it, but we want the T4PA to be essentially the same as the L1PA, which is very interesting, right? And that's that helps you set the thoracic spine also. T4 and L1PA equal. And you just set them like that, and then it sort of simplifies everything. Yeah, we, we've, we, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I guess the other question is, so then even in your fixed deformities, when you have a, so when the T10 to the sacrum and it's flat, right, you're still using the same formulas as well as the same general gestalt on how to put them into the ones and twos versus threes and fours. Yep. So you, yep. So irrespective of, okay. Here we go. Yeah, one of the things that the, um, the Leon group will say that is like if they have an old, if you have an old primary, and they're degenerated, but so like a L1, a, a type one on a young person, like suppose it was you, we could we could do a T10 to pelvis probably, but the old patients sometimes I took out Russell's slides about how they degenerate. If a type one degenerates with loss of lumbar lordosis through degeneration and loss of thoracic sort of integrity, right? And they're getting thoracic degeneration part because of like the myopathy or whatever it is and thoracic disc degeneration. Don't try and straighten their thoracic spine a lot. Fix the lumbar spine, get the pelvis back under and leave that C, but you got to cover the C. If you don't cover it, they'll just go. So older people by, try to like try to get a lot. Go long. If there's, you have to cover where there's, you cover where there's degeneration. Yeah. Not necessarily yeah. deformity, right? Yeah. Uh, the, like the, exactly. the for me, the eye-opening one was like we would see these people with thoracic lordosis as a compensatory mechanism at WashU, and we would go talk all about we're going to do ponties, and we're going to put reduction screws in, and we're going to pull out this thoracic lordosis, and failed to understand that if you fix their lordosis, the thoracic spine will take care of itself, and you can give those people T10 to the pelvis instead of making this like semi-flat. T4 to the pelvis where they can't wipe their butt anymore. Yeah, that's a bad day. But it happens a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it happens a ton. That's why we like, we got to get any this thoughts out there. On, uh, any thoughts on positioning, especially as you're doing an upper, let's say you're going up to the upper thoracic spine. Like, did you, do you cha did you change how you position these patients with the chest pads? I am super careful with the chest pads as to where they go. And if it's a, if you're covering like a 73 year old type one, I tend to put the chest pads even a little bit lower so that they fall in a little bit more so that you can define the apex of that thoracic kyphosis. Um, the hip pads are also very important. So if you have a high PI, I tend to put the hip pads below the uh, ASIS so that you can really rock that pelvis in. If, and this even goes for AIS surgery, right? Because you, 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 I think we pay not enough attention to their sagittal plane is that if they have a low PI and I don't want that to rock in and I don't want that lordosis, I will put those hip pads much higher and sometimes even do the, you know, Keith Bridwell tried to change alignment zero and he would put a chest pad, a lower rib pad, and then a hip pad. And you try to change it zero. I don't do that. I try to eat, put the hip pads where I'm going to get them to either bend in or not bend in so much. And I think really critical to really critical in making life a whole lot easier for this is using the pro axis table, that flexible bed. Uh, and hopefully that's just generation one. There's plenty of things we can do to make a bed better and really help us provide personalized targets that we can nail every time. Now, the way I, the way I see this going, hopefully is that much like, you know, when you guys use neurovision and it's red, yellow, green, uh, same thing for alignment. Yeah, I tell you, it's it's uh, it's needed. Um, um, and uh, yeah, I think good good note on the pro axis. Uh, we just got one, and it's been uh, kind of a fun, kind of fun to play with. A little bit of learning curve with it. Um, it's I, like but, we had one, and, and Larry used it a couple times and said, "Oh, that thing sucks," so I didn't use it. Uh, and then Manish showed up and had these just incredible X rays, and I said, "What what are you doing differently?" He's like, "I would love huh. to tell you that it's my technique, but it's not. It's the fact that I used the table." So if you look at the table, like for the trainees, right, that don't, don't sort of look at things with the same eye that we do. If you do a PSO on a posted frame, Keith Bridwell used to always say, wow, that's real good, but you're just giving up a little lord a little kyphosis here to get lordosis there. If you're if their body is fixed and my fingertips are the PSO and you go like this, right? My knuckles became kyphotic because the front of everything's fixed lengths 
especially the dorsal columns, fixed lengths. With the pro axis table, the chest is on a trolley. So you can actually go like that and actually shorten the dorsal column and potentially lengthen the anterior column. It gets, I, I had plenty of patients that had sort of a um, neuropraxia from stretch of the lumbar plexus. Hopefully you guys don't get to experience that. They get better, but it's nerve wracking when it sets in like day two. Boy. Exactly. <laughs> nerve wracking for me and the patient. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. Well, thanks, Mike. It's 708, so I'll let folks get to their day. But uh, anyone else have any questions before we let them, before we let Mike go?